the embryonic stirrings of imperial expansion had an important part in the development of the Stuart economy. The majority of trade at the time was one way, as the imports of raw materials from the New World outstripped any exports. Christopher Columbus discovered the New World for the West in 1492, and most of the interest in the New World came from the Dutch and Spanish. After the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, the burgeoning Puritanism of England gave rise to a desire to expand westwards. This desire was fed by a want for precious metals. In 1607, England founded Jamestown, named after the then King James I. Jamestown marked the beginning of the lucrative trade of tobacco into England. Not as valuable as gold, tobacco was the first cash crop to be exploited by the English. Tobacco was an integral part of life in Jamestown, that in 1669 the crimes of adultery and fornication were punished by a fine of up to £1,000 of tobacco. It was tobacco which enabled the British to compete with the Dutch and the customs duties tax of its importation was crucial in funding William III's campaigns. It is hard to know how much was imported, however the maximum limits give an indication of its importance. The intention of this lecture is for you to be able to answer the inquiry how significant was imperial expansion 1625 to 1688 to the economy. Knowledge wise, you will be able to describe the importance of the new world on the growth of empire. Skills wise, to assess the change in nature of mercantile growth and behaviourally to evaluate the causes of the growth of international trade. The slave trade will grow over the 17th century. However, at the beginning, the preferred method was the regular shipping over of vagrants and those willing to indenture themselves. Indentured servitude saw people contract themselves to another without pay in exchange for free passage to their new country. At the end of the contracted period of time, the individuals were freed. Most labourers in the 17th century Virginia and Maryland arrived as indentured servants. This did in some ways solve the homelessness and unemployment in Britain. However, it had little impact on the poor rates. Most settlers in Virginia and Maryland were Anglican and Catholic refugees. As the influx of refugees and settlers grew, the number of colonies also grew. The Mayflower arrived in 1620, carrying Puritan settlers to Massachusetts. In the 1630s, around 20,000 Puritans settled to avoid Archbishop Lord's persecutions. It is easy to say that New World settlers arrived escaping the religious policies of Britain at different times. However, Barry Coward also highlights a desire to resolve the issues of overpopulation and the opening up of new markets for trade behind the colonisation of North America. The northern colonies continued to grow, never as large as the south up to 1688. Farming, fishing and shipbuilding were essential industries fueling economic growth. Newfoundland, founded in 1583, provided resources such as fish, which were shipped back to England to be traded on the continent. The southern colonies focused on tobacco to begin with and later cotton. The story of colonisation of North America shows no plan. It was a colonisation of contrasting stories. On one hand, high church Catholic and Anglican settlers were running large plantations for the export of tobacco, and on the other, Puritan colonies attempted to create New Zion with deeply religious societies where all were equal under the eyes of God. Both were generally positive for the Stuart economy. The colonial success in the Caribbean was the outcome of Spanish conquest. The Spanish navy was powerful and occupied the important islands of Cuba and Jamaica. English experimental expeditions which happened under Elizabeth and James I saw Bermuda in the Atlantic becoming occupied in 1612. In 1624 a small number of settlers moved to St Kitts and the founder, Sir Thomas Warner, began growing tobacco with limited trade with Europe taking place. After the 1620s, Spanish sea power was declining due to attacks by pirates and economic depression in Spain due to the Thirty Years' War. This gave British colonists 
an opportunity. The British claimed Montserrat, Barbuda and Antigua as British colonies. After 1674, sugar became Antigua's primary crop and this influenced other Caribbean islands and the massive expansion of the sugar crop saw the explosion of the Atlantic slave trade. During the interregnum, Cromwell's protectorate committed to expanding trade and influence. This was known as the Grand Western Design, meant to disrupt the Spanish monopoly on trade in the Caribbean. Massive investment in the British Navy saw 109 vessels built and 111 captured between 1646 and 1659. In 1655, in an attempt to break the Spanish hold on the Caribbean, Britain attacked Hispaniola. This failed, so they seized Jamaica instead. The Spanish on Jamaica released their slaves and encouraged them to attack the British. It was not until 1660 that the Spanish were defeated. Large estates were established on Jamaica and the slave population grew from 7,000 in 1670 to 55,000 in 1713. Due to the reduction in the price of tobacco, sugar was the crop. By 1662, 4,000 British settlers from England, Scotland and Wales were in Jamaica. Due to the demand in England, cocoa and coffee were also grown. The importance of Jamaica between 1655 and 1688 is for two reasons. The capture of Jamaica and the Cayman Islands led to the Treaty of Madrid with Spain in 1670. Spain as a result recognised English possessions in the Caribbean and ships were allowed to sail freely between the islands. The success of the sugar trade was massive. As slaves replaced the British indentured servants, its success was dramatic after 1688. This is primarily due to the fact Jamaica was not part of the previously established transatlantic trade routes. It is surprising considering the pace of development was slow in the 16th century that the growth of international trade was sudden. There are a number of factors converging which explain why this happened. The Royal Navy, which had been growing in influence since the Tudors, was able to enforce English supremacy at sea. A combination of the growth of Protestantism and the Thirty Years' War reducing Spanish territory was happening concurrently with the decline of the Catholic Spanish Empire. The Navigation Acts, which we will look at in a moment, reduced the strength of other naval powers. Mercantilism, which is the practice of accumulating wealth via trade, created a self-sufficient economy. And during the interregnum, mercantilism reached its peak having begun under the Tudors. The historian Ralph Davis classes this as a commercial revolution and it was the Rump Parliament which passed the first Navigation Act in 1651. The Act stated, no goods or commodities whatsoever of the growth, production or manufacture of Asia, Africa or America or any part thereof or of any islands belonging to them all which are described or laid down in the usual maps or cards or those places, as well as the English plantations as others, shall be imported or brought into this Commonwealth of England or into Ireland or any other land, islands, plantations or territories to this Commonwealth belonging or in their possession in any other ship or ships, vessel or vessels whatsoever but only in such as do truly and without fraud belong only to the people of this commonwealth or the plantations thereof. According to the Act, all imported goods to England or any territories had to be carried on English ships. This was an attempt to remove the Dutch monopoly of transatlantic trade. It was stated that at least 50% of crews had to be English nationals. Christopher Hill sees the Navigation Act as the victory of national trading over that of private trading companies. The Act helped English new draperies to dominate the textile trade and reduced the reliance on imported cheese and agricultural staples. It also increased the customs revenue by three and a half times between 1643 and 1659. After the Restoration, 
and the repeal of acts passed by the Commonwealth, the Navigation Act was modified and retained. Drawn up by Cromwell's ambassador to the Dutch, it highlights the continuation of interregnum politics during the Restoration. The new act extended the restrictions to exports, including tobacco and sugar. The Staple Act of 1663 enhanced the Navigation Act of 1660 by stating that all goods from the continent to the colonies had to pass through England, protected imports and exports in the second half of the century. As the population grew in the New World, the empire became wealthier via its exports of raw materials. In 1673, the Plantation Duty Act ensured that captains of English ships delivered specified goods to England or they would face a financial penalty. The intention of this lecture was for you to be able to answer the inquiry how significant was imperial expansion 1625 to 1688 to the economy. Knowledge wise, you will now be able to describe the importance of the new world on the growth of empire. Skills wise, you need to be able to assess the change in nature of mercantile growth via the associated material. Behaviourally, then to evaluate the causes of the growth of international trade. Now complete the associated materials.